this here. I can't see it. The May 15th meeting of the Eden Prairie City Council will now come to order. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prior to the start of each council meeting, we have open podium, which is an opportunity for Eden Prairie residents to address the City Council on issues related to Eden Prairie City government. This portion of the meeting is from approximately 6.30 to 6.55 in the Council Chambers. If you wish to speak at that time, please contact the City Manager's Office at 949-8412 by noon of the meeting date with your name, your phone number, and the subject matter you wish to discuss. If time permits, after scheduled speakers, are finished, then I will open up the floor to other speakers. This portion of the meeting is not recorded, nor is it televised. If you have any questions, again, please contact the city manager's office. We have a number of uh, presentations tonight. The first is a Heritage Preservation Award, and I think we have the chair of our Heritage Preservation Commission, Steve Olson, here. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, staff. My name is Steve Olson. I have the good fortune to chair the Heritage Preservation Commission. Once again, I have the privilege of giving a few remarks and providing some background on this year's Heritage Preservation Award recipient. This is the fourth Eden Prairie Heritage Preservation Award. As a weekend corn and soybean farmer in Winona County, I very much appreciate this year's award recipient. Roots. Roots are important, they are important to plants, they are important to families. A plant with shallow roots is fragile. When a big wind comes, there is too little to support or anchor the plant and it falls over and is lodged. The crop value is reduced or lost and it becomes extremely difficult to harvest what remains. Shallow roots are also a problem in a dry year. With a shallow root system, a plant is unable to reach the moisture that may lie deeper in the soil. Such a plant will wither in a hot, dry summer. A plant with deep roots will reach the deeper moisture and continue to grow. In 1886, a young man named Seaver Peterson emigrated from Sweden to the US. He arrived in Illinois, looked for work in many places, and found a way north and settled in Minneapolis. Eventually, he owned a confectionery in North Minneapolis. In 1887, a young woman named Mary Person emigrated from Sweden as well. She arrived in Minnesota and was sponsored by relatives in Kokato. In 1896, the young woman and the young man would marry. They would live above the confectionery store on Washington Avenue in North Minneapolis. In 1899, they decided to leave the city they felt it would be better for their family in the country. They bought 40 acres of land in Eden Prairie on Spring Road. They set down roots for their family. For most farmers, a century farm or a farm that has been in a family for at least 100 years is quite an achievement. The Petersons have been farming in Eden Prairie for nearly 120 years. Seaver and the First and Mary's roots have grown deep and strong. Lorraine Soam wrote in her book, Once Upon a Time, let us turn the pages back to the story of the Seaver and Peterson family, the family most admired in the pioneer community for their honesty, generosity, and helpfulness in the face of trouble or need. Now let us talk about Seaver Peterson III. Seaver was nominated for this award by the Eden Prairie Historical Society. He was born in 1944 graduated from Eden Prairie High School in 1962. He's a college graduate, and he served in Vietnam as a volunteer with the Medical Relief Organization. Seaver cares about our community. How do I know? One does not work to save buildings in a community unless one cares about that community. Seaver worked with Kathy Case and others in 1999 
to help save the historic consolidated gym. During the presentation to the school board, Seaver shared the story of the bird called the killdeer. This bird builds a nest on the ground in the farm fields. Their loud cry alarms the farmer on the tractor that there are eggs in the nest and to stay clear. Seaver used this analogy to describe the preservationist who shared their stories about wanting to save the gym. Today, if you drive down Scenic Heights Road, you can still see that the historic consolidated school gym still stands. Seaver has served on the Eden Prairie Historical Society board and is an honorary board member. He is a reliable resource for the information and help, of our, and help for the historical society. The roots of the Peterson family continue to bear fruit and benefit our community. I'd like to close with an Amelia Earhart quote that I think fits Seaver. No kind action ever stops with itself. One kind action leads to another. Good example is followed. A single act of kindness throws out roots in all directions, and the roots spring up and make new trees. The greatest work that kindness does to others is that it makes them kind themselves. The recipient of the 2018 Eden Prairie Heritage Preservation Award is Seaver Peterson III. Next on the agenda, a presentation from Tour de Tonka. Jennifer. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, thanks for having us here this evening. My name is Jenny Badurka. I'm a coordinator um, with Minnetonka Community Education, the program that puts on Tour to Tonka. So thanks for having us again here. We enjoy the opportunity to visit the cities that the tour goes through um, to tell them a little bit about our previous year's success and the events to come for the year. So a few quick updates uh, by the numbers um, as we go around. 24 is the number of communities we travel through in Tour de Tonka. Um, 616 is the number of volunteers we had last year to make the event happen. 88 was our oldest rider last year in the Tour de Tonka. Wow. And um, 22,235 uh, is how much money we spend to um, secure safety and police departments to support the event at the critical corners. Um, we spend $11,954 on the food that we provide at our rest stops for our participants. We work with 108 different agencies, whether that's cities, police departments, um, other organizations. And 42 states have been represented uh, to date in Tour de Tonka. For those who are interested in volunteering, uh, as you heard, we need lots of volunteers. So visit our website uh, to learn more about volunteering or to register for one of the rides. Um, this is a bit of a recap from last year. We had seven ride options for participants. Um, the 100 mile, 30 mile, and 48 mile all had over 700 riders. So we've had a pretty consistent about 3,500 um, participants each year in the ride. Last year, riders came from 166 different communities, 40 counties in Minnesota, 25 states and two countries. And as I said before, 40 states have participated since 2006. 
These are the states that um, we had riders in from last year. And these are the states we're still looking to get to participate. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know anyone who lives there and they'd like to come visit you, please encourage them to come. They might want to leave a Hawaii right now and come here. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. They're going to yeah. bike all the way, yeah. Uh, something that we share each year is just the number of riders from each of our communities in the surrounding area. So Eden Prairie continues to be uh, in the top 10, number three, um, doing very well. And uh, looks like they gained um, 12 riders from last year or from the previous year, 2016. Um, and just we'll click, quickly f flip through those that make up the top 40 communities. It's very consistent that we're, we have about 60% men, 40% women, um, and that 30 to 50 age group is our most um, popular. But we have some young ones and those a little bit older, so something for everyone to choose from. Youngest rider last year was four. Uh, as part of Tour de Tonka, we support the ICA food shelf, so to date we've raised over $60,000 to support that group, and we're really proud of that. Just a glimpse at some of the communities that we travel through, uh, including Eden Prairie. And we work closely with um, the city and Eden Prairie Police to make this event a success. So we thank you for your continued support. And this year we have eight options of rides for our participants, 16, 30, 36, 48, 57, 62, 71, and 100. So, um, lots of different options. This is the first year we've had eight different choices. Uh, this is a bit of the map of the metro, where we go and um, what ride goes where. Lots of the green is the rest stops along the way, um, one of which is Lake Riley Park, and we've been going there a long time. It's a great um, rest stop for us. We have some wonderful sponsors that help make this event affordable for our community um, and support us in many ways. And the shirt for this year is here. It looks really um, nice. It looks like a bike jersey a lot. Um, and we do have a men's and a women's cut in that for the, the participants. And they'll also receive um, a baseball hat from our sponsor Invicta. So, those hats are being made now, but all volunteers and riders will receive those. Last year we had sunglasses from Subaru, which I think we gave to all of you, and today we gave you guys a little pop socket for your phone that has Tour de Tonk on it, so you can enjoy that. Uh, a few photos to recap last year's ride, which was wonderful. We had a beautiful day and um, another successful year. And thank you again just for your continued support. We hope to see you all there on August 4th, whether you're volunteering or riding, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Good thank to you hear so from much. you again. Best have wishes yep. on the event. Thank you. Uh, next item is a presentation of our 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and this is something we spent about a half an hour on in our council workshop prior to tonight's meeting. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor and the Council for allowing me to come to the Council meeting tonight to present the audit results for 2017's audit. There should be a PowerPoint, there we go, and I will go through this as, as the Mayor mentioned, we did meet in the work session prior to this and we went through it in more detail, so this will be a, a high level overview of the audit results for 2017. Uh, this year, the audit team, as we listed them on, this, on the site here, myself, John, and Troy are all returning and uh, in charge of running the city's engagement. And outside of that, then we also had several associates as well that we worked with for this year's audit. As far as the actual audit results, the council uh, would have received a separate uh, communications letter that details out a lot of required communications that we have. So I'm not going to go through, through those in detail tonight. The city did receive an unmodified or a clean audit opinion this year. That is the best that you can do. And then also we would let you know if we had any material weaknesses, significant efficiencies, legal compliance, as you can see on the screen, we had no on all of those. So very positive to report there. As far as the actual audit results go for this year, this first slide we're looking at the, the general fund revenues and fund balances and expenditures. As you can see, the revenues this year we're over budget by about 1% or $455,000 for very accurate, so very accurate there. 
the biggest driver of that is going to be your intergovernmental grants and then also community center fees were both over budget this year expenditures this year when we looked at it uh, if you think about when the city did this budget process when you came through at the end of 2017 you were actually within seventy three thousand dollars just slightly over budget and what a lot of that was was due to some turnout gear that was purchased right towards the end of the year so that was kind of that last piece of equipment that popped you over budget but outside of that very close to budget budget very positive there there was a eight hundred and seventy thousand dollar decrease this year in the general fund budget or general fund fund balance this year but really what that was was due to the city calling the 2007 a lease revenue bonds early in paying those directly out of fund balance so that was the biggest driver of why your fund balance decreased this year as far as the actual enterprise funds for the city uh, this first slide we're looking at both the water and the wastewater and the the revenues this year they did increase about 2.6 percent and that was a driver of both a uh, decrease in usage but also then an increase in rates so they were able to offset each other and give you an actual overall increase in revenues and then the water fund also has a, a goal set for maintaining a certain level of cash reserves that goal is a minimum of 10.9 million and at the end of 2017 the city was at 11.8 so you met your goal in that fund as far as wastewater revenue this year your your revenues increased by 1.3 percent or just about seventy four thousand dollars this was a combination similar to water where it was a decrease in usage but an increase in rates so there the rates are keeping up with that decrease in the usage in this one the similar to the water fund the wastewater fund also has a cash reserve goal and you're meeting that goal as well of having 4.4 million dollars in cash reserves looking at the stormwater fund this year revenues increased by 12 12.4 percent that was a, a direct re, um, in direct relation to a rate increase that the city enacted for 2017 and this year you have 1.3 million dollars on cash on hand versus 793,000 last year so a good increase there and in 2015 that cash balance was actually negative so very good cash uh, building some cash reserves into that fund now Li the liquor operations this year there was a, a slight decrease of 1.8 percent but when we looked at surrounding community communities that was actually a, a positive result other communities that we're seeing have uh, significantly more decreases than what the city experienced so you're so you're able to uh, weather some of that the other thing that's very positive with the liquor operations is the city was able to transfer seven hundred thousand dollars out of the liquor fund into the capital improvement maintenance fund so very positive results to have that there and then your overall gross profit percentage was 26.6 percent which is actually uh, about a full percent higher than the 2016 seven county metro average so very positive there as well looking at the estimated market value for the city for 2017 we also include 2018 and as you can see when we finally slide into 2018 you're going to be back above what the historical high had been for the city back in 2009 so you can see the the values in the city have basically recovered now to what they were pre-recession and then this one we are looking at what the tax capacity is versus the tax rates are for the city typically there would be an inverse relationship to this just as a driver between the the rates compared to what the capacity is but in for 2018 in 17 and also started in 2016 as the city has been um, slightly increasing those tax rates so you're not seeing that inverse relationship anymore but really what that means is you're capturing some of that tax capacity that's been created with the increase in the values and in, in that over the last couple of years looking on this slide what we did here is um, worked with the city here to come up with a, a pretty much a big laundry list of surrounding communities and what we did is we took the the median home value in Eden Prairie and we applied the tax rate for the various uh, cities on this graph as you can see Eden Prairie came in at basically the fourth lowest when you looked at this list of cities so so it's very good to see that you're able to control those tax rates compared to some of the surrounding communities this is my favorite slide and this reflects <laughs> just <coughs> this reflects just the city portion this excludes the county and the school district and all those other special districts when we look at this this next slide looking at the revenues per capita what this is is we compare that to what the statewide average is for similar sized cities it is a very large large span of 20 to 100,000 in population but at least gives you some 
some um, comparison. A couple of things to note here is the city has historically now since 2003 now received local government aid, which is designed to help be an offset to, to taxes. Since the city doesn't receive that, your per capita property tax line is gonna be a little bit higher than communities of, of similar size around the state, which that's just a, a derivative of that. The other thing is that uh, when you look at it compared to your intergovernmental revenues, as you can see that line when you look at the non-LGA line, that can have some pretty good variation each year. Because what that is is that really tells us how much the city has received in other grant dollars, whether uh, typically they're construction-based type grants, so to help provide for infrastructure improvements, those types of things. When we look at the expenditure side here, uh, a couple of things that I like to point out when we look at the expenditures per capita, when you compare to other similar sized cities, um, one thing that really stands out is the city spends uh, more dollars on a per capita looking at police and fire, so looking at the, the protection of, this, of the citizens, but then also the other one that stands out a lot on here is parks and recreation. You're funding the, the parks and the rec center and those types of activities in the city, which is very positive to see that. Meanwhile, mean, or meanwhile retaining that lower tax rate that you've seen on the, in the past. So those are really good relations to have there. And then the other thing that you can that you can see is the city, compared to other municipalities this side, spends quite a bit less in the debt service. So that's principal and interest. So very good to see that you're maintaining those debt levels and still being able to provide the high level of service and the amenities that come along with the, the parks and the rec and those types of activities. So very good there. As far as just some other real brief financial highlights, the, the city's audit is going to be submitted to the state auditor's office as required by state statute. And also that it'll be submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association for their certificate program both by the June 30th deadline this year as well. The city does have a AAA bond rating, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware. But as you can see, when we look at the cities and try to com get some comparison data there, it's, it's, it's tougher to find. But there's very few cities in Minnesota that have that AAA bond rating, so very good to see that there. And then also last year, the city did receive the certificate from the Government Finance Officers Association as well. That makes every year since 1990 that the city's received that award. So very, very good to see that as well. Um, and then lastly, just a couple of real quick standards that are coming out over the next couple of years. Not going to spend a lot of time on them. The first one's looking at post-employment benefits or uh, retiree access to medical insurance. That'll be a big one for next year. Um, but that's really a lot of that's on the actuaries to provide the city the data for that so you can properly implement that. And then outside of that, uh, Statement 85, just a cleanup standard. Nothing real significant there. And then 86 is dealing with when the city refunds bonds internally with your own cash reserves, with the city historically has not done that. Outside of that, the next big one is going to be Statement 87, which is now a couple of years out yet, but that one will just be a lot of data accumulation. So the accounting should be fairly easy, just going to be a lot of data accumulation. <coughs> so outside of that, um, I just want to thank everybody within the, the finance department and at the city that we work with during the audit. It is an undertaking. The, the city finance staff were all very well prepared as they've been in the past. Um, prompt with answering questions and makes the audit go really efficient. So I do appreciate all of their hard work and effort as well. Thank you. Um, did anybody have any questions for Mr. Knopic? Yes, Councilmember Case. Oh, you, I'm sorry. Turn my mic oh, on. You just turned your oh. mic on. Ready okay. to make a motion. Sorry. We, we had all the presentation right. down in the workshop, right. so Just want to thank our, uh, thank our staff uh, in our audit department, I mean, in our finance department, Sue, Sue Kachiever and all the rest of the staff that work with Sue. They do a fantastic job, and, and mm -hmm. we're just proud, so proud of them for doing such a good job. And thank, thank you, you this year as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, of course. Thank you. Is there a motion? I would move to accept the 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, the next items are Mr. Lothammer's venue. Your Honor, Council Members, uh, Your Honor, if I could invite you down to join us in receiving these uh, awards tonight. Um, we have two awards um, from the Minnesota Recreation and Parks Association, awards of excellence in two different categories. I'd like to invite Amy Peterson to uh, join us. She is uh, <coughs> representing the Minnesota Recreation and Parks Association. She's also on their awards committee. Amy and I have also had the privilege of being on the board uh, together. And probably most importantly, Amy is an Eden Prairie resident. 
So we're glad to have her. It's special for her to do the uh, presentation um, for us. So we thank her for doing that. But also, I'd like to ask Matt Bourne, our Parks and Natural Resources Manager, and also uh, Lori Brink, our Recreation Services Manager, to come forward. They'll be able to tell us a little bit more about uh, what the <coughs> awards were uh, won for. Well, thank you, Your Honor and, and Council Members. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to present two uh, Minnesota Park and Re or Recreation and Park Association um, 2017 Award of Excellence for two outstanding projects. However, before I do that, I just want to take a few moment, moments to tell you about the Minnesota Recreation and Park Association. The Minnesota Recreation and Park Association was formed in 1937 to foster the growth and development of the parks and recreation profession throughout the state. Presently, we have around 850 professionals, corporate, board commission, student, and re retiree members throughout the state. Members of the association come from municipal, county, state, district, commercial, and private agencies. The Minnesota Recreation and Park Associ Association office is located in Fridley. The MRPA Awards Committee was created in 1987 with the purpose of acknowledging individual members and agencies for their excellence in the field of parks, recreation, and leisure services. Award committee members represent a cross-section of association members from the state of Minnesota. The awards committee feels it's important to increase awareness and appreciation for the excellent parks, trails, facilities, recreation programs, and services that are occurring here in Minnesota. The Awards of Excellence is an annual program of the Minnesota Recreation and Park Association that was solely created to recognize agencies and their staff for ex exemplary projects that was either implemented in, in 2017 or received substantial revisions in 2017. MRPA members may nominate a project in an Awards of Excellence in seven different categories, administrative or management strategies, communications, park and facilities, programming and events, sponsorship and partnerships, sustainability and volunteer initiatives. Nominations receive, received are then reviewed, evaluated and scored by award committee members. Only the top scoring nominations are selected to receive award of excellence and recognition. So on behalf of the MRP awards committee, it's my pleasure tonight to first to present an award of excellence to the Eden Prairie Parks and Rec Recreation Department for its, um, for the project, the Riley Lake Park renovation in the category of um, parks and facilities. Come on up. And then you want to talk about that, and then I'll. Madam Mayor, members of the council, as most of you know, uh, we undertook a renovation project at Riley Lake Park last year. Uh, the main focus of that project was to improve circulation around the boat launch area and then also add some new uh, facilities at the beach and the picnic area and lakeshore area to really kind of bring that park back to life. But the biggest thing that set this project apart from a lot of the other ones was the collaboration that we went through in the planning process. So from multiple departments within the city, the park commission, planning commission, city council, and then also um, the Let's Go Fishing group that's staged out of Lake Riley. Uh, the Riley Lake Homeowners Association was involved. Uh, the Watershed District just on and on uh, throughout the planning process that was able to make it really uh, a park that's now gonna be um, able to be used safely, enjoyed. Um, and so we hope to see you guys all back out there in July for our grand reopening. So thank you. And so next I would like to present um, award of excellence to the city of Eden Prairie and the Eden Prairie Parks and Rec Recreation Department for its winning project in the um, category of communications and marketing for the summer camp preview. Your Honor, members of the council, on behalf of the Parks and Recreation staff, I want to thank MRPA for this award. Um, Summer Camp Preview was a marketing effort that was uh, planned in direct response to what our local families were telling us. They love our summer programming, but they wanted to hear about it sooner. They want to plan their summer calendar uh, 
There are families that plan their summer vacation around when sa safety camp is held for second graders. And so we needed to let them know that sooner. So we uh, came out with a new publication. It's called Destination Summer. And that comes out in January already, letting people know what's happening for what age groups at what times in the summer. And then on President's Day, our staff came in and we held a camp preview day on a day off of school. Families came in and they could talk to camp staff, learn more about programs, and if they've never held a lacrosse stick before, they could try it out before they signed up for camp. And so our families uh, responded very well to that. In fact, um, we held it again this year and we added a job fair component. So on that President's Day, we also held a job fair for high school and college students so that um, they could come on, on their day off and check out getting a job as a camp counselor this, in the summer. So uh, I want to thank our communication staff that helped us with this effort and also just to let you know, this was not a marketing effort that talked a whole lot about soccer skills. It talked a lot about developmental assets for kids like leadership and exploration and all of the great things that kids gain from participating in our program. So thank you. So the next item, um, we have another set of awards, and you've met now two of the three managers in the Parks and Recreation Department, and Valerie didn't want to be left out. So <laughs> I'm going to ask Valerie Verley, our Community Center Manager, to come forward and uh, tell you about the uh, uh, best awards. Thank you. Your Honor, Council Members, um, it's my pleasure to present to you these awards tonight. Um, I was here about this time last year, if you remember, presenting an award for the Sun Current. It's a regional award that goes out to a different uh, award, awards for different facilities, parks, things like that throughout the region, so different communities win in different categories. But this is the fourth year that ours has won for the best recreational center. Um, unlike past years, we have been awarded two additional awards this year by the Sun Current Readers, um, Best Fitness Center and Best Indoor Water Park, um, which are two that I'm even more proud of because that does put us on par and more in comparison with some facilities in the private sector um, and is more of a direct comparison in that respect than the Best Recreational Center. So um, we're honored to again have the Eden Prairie Community Center's various amenities recognized by our residents as a high quality community asset. And I'd like to present these three awards to Mayor Tira Lukens. that department is going to need a little more wall space for all these awards they're winning. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Any items to add? Mr. Uh, Getchell. Yes, Mayor, there is one item. We have uh, a consent item, additional consent item L. It's in the annotated agenda. It's a resolution relating to, uh, to a grant we received. The city applied for and received a congestion management and air quality grant from the Federal Transit Administration to help with the construction of the town center station that would be part of Southwest Transit. So that item is added to the consent agenda. Okay. All in favor of the uh, agenda as amended? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Is there a motion of approval for the minutes from the council workshop on Tuesday, May 1st? So moved. moved. Second. Any items to correct? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. I'd like a motion for approval of the minutes from the council meeting held the same date. So moved. Second. Any items to correct there? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Is there a motion for approval of items A through L on the consent calendar? Move approval. Second. Anything to pull for discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Or the motion passes. That brings us to ordinances and resolutions. We have one item, uh, adopt a resolution requesting Eden Prairie retailers to discontinue sales of assault style weapons and to increase the minimum purchase age for guns to 21. 
Mr. Getcho, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, Mayor, uh, maybe just mention as an introduction uh, at the April 17th council meeting, the city attorney provided a presentation, an overview of the city's legal authority related to firearms and uh, cities, actually cities throughout the state of Minnesota and the city of Eden Prairie. So it was understood at that time that the city, uh, its only authority uh, per ordinance or regulation had to do with the discharge of firearms within our community. Uh, so the request was made to prepare a non-binding resolution, a resolution that simply requests the retailers, as you read, Mayor, in the title of the item, request uh, retailers to discontinue the sales of assault-style weapons and to increase the minimum age for purchase of guns to age 21 in the city of Eden Prairie. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So as Mr. Getcho said tonight, we're considering a resolution that would direct the mayor to send a letter to gun shops requesting that they follow the lead of Dix and Walmart and voluntarily cease selling assault style weapons and not sell to individuals under the age of 21. Two of the really important words here are requesting and voluntarily. This idea came about at a council meeting about a month ago when pressured by so many residents who were concerned about the latest rounds of gun violence, um, we explored actions that we could take as a city. Our city attorney looked into this and reported basically what we already thought, that there's really no action that we can take on restricting gun sales. We simply do not have that authority. So in light of what Dix and Walmart have done, the thought was that we request local gun shops to follow suit. Um, did we think that this letter would result in them voluntarily doing it. I can't speak for other council members, but I know from a meeting that I had with Steve Scheel that he, he said, I, will, I would not abide by that. Um, however, we did feel like we had to do something. Um, given the emails that I've received in the last four days, we've gotten a lot of emails, there's a great deal of misunderstanding out there, and I don't know if that is deliberate or not, but certainly someone sent an email to gun owners, probably on Saturday, given that that was the point where we got a sudden influx of opposition email. And probably somebody else that was a gun control advocate did the same thing um, probably Monday, because then we were flooded with uh, a bunch of emails from supporters of this resolution. Um, but to address the misinformation here, it is not a ban on the sale of assault rifles. It is not a ban on selling weapons to those under age 21. This is not a law. It is not an ordinance even, it's just simply a request. So council members, discussion. Council member Butcher, Butcher Wickstrom. Yes, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank the residents and um, people living outside Eden Prairie for the large number of emails. I can't even tell you how many I have and also the phone calls that I've received um, about this particular resolution. And I really appreciate the mayor defining or clarifying that this resolution truly is um, it's a position it's a, an opinion um, or sort of the will of a governing body and is non-regulatory um, it was interesting the um, well it matters what people have to say I mean you know we have our um, opinions here but when we get a lot of feedback very very important and so um, after listening and reading your messages uh, it was really interesting to see that some people thought we didn't go far enough on the resolution and other people thought we shouldn't be doing it at all so it was um, kind of um, interesting the other <coughs> opinion that I heard was one that really resonated with me and that was why not gather more perspectives in other words don't be hasty um, have greater dialogue and discussion about this issue before writing a resolution or putting a resolution forward um, and so I actually believe that that um, after a lot of reflection on it and conversation, that we really do need additional uh, people's voices to be heard. I think we need young adults. I think we need students, um, the school district, uh, obviously our businesses, public safety, uh, and mental health professionals. I think the dialogue, the conversation needs to be larger. Um, 
because gun violence takes place in communities, I think it is important that we have a community conversation. I'm not sure what that should look like or who should facilitate it, but I think we can figure that out. It might be the Citizens League, the League of Minnesota Cities, I don't know, we might get uh, the National League of Cities to offer us help with how to do that. Um, because what I did here, really, in um, <coughs> basically all of the messages that I read and that um, messages that I spoke with people about, and that was that people wanted to prevent um, these tragic effects um, and they wanted to honor and value, you know, all this human life, all human life. And I think this is a very good place for us to start. So, um, I would propose that we pull this resolution um, that we have in front of us this evening and work on a method for creating a more comprehensive resolution for such an important issue, because this issue is not going to go away. Um, at such a meeting, I think we can bring in our legislators who need to hear what we have to say, need to hear what our residents have to say, um, because they will be making decisions also. Um, uh, so um, I believe there are other items to include, as I mentioned, mental health approaches, um, programs like uh, the gun buyback, amnesty, um, the amnesty program. I mean, there are a number of things that I think we can look at that we probably haven't included in um, our conversations or our resolution. Um, and so finally, I did want to say that I do appreciate the leadership on the council for bringing this idea forward. And I want to um, appreciate uh, council member Case's leadership on this, just bringing the idea that we need to have um, something, we need to do something. Um, I do believe local government is the place uh, to play a role in um, community safety. And um, I think gun violence prevention is one of the things we do need to talk about. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Um, I too think that um, I'm very concerned about gun violence prevention. And I like portions of this resolution, but there's one portion of this resolution, unless changed, is something I cannot vote for. Um, I was somewhat concerned all along about the 21 year, you know, but right now state law says that 18 year olds have the right to purchase. <coughs> and if we ask our gun owners to go against state law for an age group, that's discrimination. It's no different than if somebody once refused to seat black people in their restaurants. It's no different than a 58-year-old being passed over for promotion because they think they're too old. That, too, is age discrimination. And I do not believe that the city should ask businesses or any other person to, to discriminate against a group of people strictly on their age or their color or their national or origin or anything else. And I do not believe that this belongs in a resolution because it is discrimination and I cannot vote for discrimination in any form. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Case. First I want to turn on my mic. It, it may seem like to so many people that a council like this comes with um, as a group our mind made up and really nothing's further from the truth because of open meeting law we're not permitted to to conduct business except in public so we have to think this through in front of all of you together um, so I um, respect all four of my fellow council council member colleagues up here and the mayor of course one of the four the mayor more so thank you you're welcome um, <laughs> But I have, I don't know what they're, or I did not know what they're thinking was exactly coming, and we had a, a chance to chat um, back in our last workshop. So just to lay that out there, um, I, I also do truly uh, want to thank everyone that emailed us 
Uh, I did not count. I, um, gosh, I'm guessing I answered over 100 today alone. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe 150 total. Um, I, I know with all the angst and polarity in America today, it, it doesn't seem like we have a lot to celebrate as democracy, but we do. <laughs> the fact that 150 of you responded or cared enough about any on either side of that to um, to write to us. Some of them were very short, as I probably would have done, just hey, I'd vote for it or vote against it. But uh, three or four of you wrote three and four and five paragraph. You're, you must be my learning style. I, I, I loved it. I mean, it was like 500 words. Uh, and I responded back to many of, to several of those four, three or four or five, with, I, I don't count them, but several hundred word essays. And then you responded back again to me, and it was really good dialogue. Um, I, I'll lay out in a moment, and I, I think everyone's pretty um, clear that I'm, I lean toward the side of we've got to do something across America. We have to figure this out. Um, I, I don't think that means touching in any way the Second Amendment. I don't think that means really limiting uh, law-abiding citizens' rights to buy guns. I think it means something, though. Um, with, with that being said, therefore, the people that I felt most um, positive about connecting with were the people that were very, very, very heartfelt pro-NRA, pro-gun ownership, and we were able to respectfully communicate. I think that's powerful for America. I also had an opportunity with the mayor to, as um, um, Council Member Brad Aho and, and Kathy Nelson did in a, in a, because of open meeting law, in a separate meeting, uh, we met with Steve Shields, very respectful, very um, positive. And then um, one of the supporters, then, and I, I hate to characterize it too, but the more um, pro-gun owner side um, emailed me and said, have you ever been in the Arnzen store? Have you ever talked to Dan Arnzen? I hadn't. So Saturday I stopped by. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not crazy about guns, but I was very impressed with the store. It reminded me of uh, an Apple you know, store. Um, just very, Dan Arnzen's done a great job. Um, a lot of people in there, a lot of, I don't know, 10, 15 workers at the start. It was just a, a really nice atmosphere, except I'm not crazy about guns, but the store itself was, um, was I thought, very um, uh, well run. And so Dan and I talked for about a half an hour, very respectful. Um, I walked out into his uh, workroom afterwards and talked to four more of his staff and enjoyed ch chatting with them. So. That's what gives me hope for America, that we can have conversations like that. As much as you know, America is so um, polarly divided today on so many issues, probably, I don't know, arguably, there are so many out there, pick and choose, but probably none more than guns. Um, and and I, I, I wanna say that as much as I do lean clearly toward the side, I don't own a gun. I, I do think something needs to be done in America, but, but I do respect law-abiding citizens' rights to purchase known guns. And, and not just for the personal protection, there's a whole group of people out there that love the recreation part of guns. I, I, I get that. And, and someday, I may want to exercise that right myself to protect my home and my family. So I do not want to give that right up. And I think so many of us that want something done it's, it's not a black or white. It's not all on one side or, or the other. So with that said, in my, I don't even know, 20-some conversations, the hundreds of emails, the many in-person contacts with Eden Prairie residents on both sides of this issue, I, I've come to the conclusion in, in these really heartfelt, good conversations that 95% of us could agree on a list. I can give some ideas on what might be on that list, but, but there are things that America could come together if we wanted to. And, and this is true of so many other issues, too. Why don't we? You know, political parties, money. I mean, there, there's the, the money is in the extremes. You raise lots of campaign money on extremes on any of these issues, on both sides, Democrats and Republicans. So that keeps us from being able to get to the middle. But there are there are lots of common sense ideas, and I got most of the ideas in my, that I've got on my piece of paper from my conversations with pro-NRA, pro-gun ownership people. They're the ones that gave me these, these, these amazing ideas that 
that I think are, are common to all of us. So w one of my conversations, which was with a self-avowed gun-owning NRA member, um, brought up this idea that, that it, it's about fear. And, and I think that's true. I think we're all living in this fear. There's fear on the one side um, that uh, people who favor gun control laws, that we, we're just scared. You know, and I think, I think everyone needs to acknowledge that. that there, that's a real fear. There's fear on the gun-owning side that they don't want to lose their rights to not be scared to protect themselves, to protect themselves against others who get guns illegally. And so this polarity, this lack of common ground, the political posturing goes on and on. And so tonight, we're looking at this small, and it's so true, albeit symbolic gesture, that this council is considering taking in an attempt just to move the conversation needle. Maybe there's a million other ways to do it. Maybe there's better ways. I get that. And it looks like maybe we won't even pass it tonight. And that's okay. We've had this conversation. But, but make no mistake, I, I would be in total favor of our local gun-owning stores voluntarily uh, deciding somehow to restrict their sales that gives the perception possibly that we might be safer. And by the way, not that to get into the weeds, but all gun stores have a right and do exercise that right to not sell guns to certain people. If somebody comes in and they're smelling of alcohol, they, they won't be sold a gun. If someone comes in and they're acting strange, and that's a subjective thing, um, they respect their, and I, and I got this from the owners of the gun source, so I think it's accurate, but so the point is, is that, I don't know if that's discrimination, but the point is they're already exercising some of that. So if that occurred more so, I would support it. But we've been told from um, both our conversations with uh, Steve Shields and, and Dan Arnson that they will not abide by this particular resolution. So there are some who might say that, that this is not, this, this whole conversation tonight is not within the purview of municipal local government. So I, I really totally disagree. Granted, passing the law is not within the purview, but there's nothing more within the purview of local city councils across this nation doing anything within their power that helps their citizenry be more safe. This may not do it tonight, I, I admit that, but to have that conversation is nothing, we, this is exactly what we ought to be doing. We, I, I've been elected to do that. Everyone up here has been elected to really do that, and we've been elected as well to make a difference. That's subjective, but we've been elected for that. So we'll passing a symbolic resolution that has already been rejected by two out of our three area stores, and we haven't really contacted the third, will it make a difference? No, I doubt it. <laughs> It won't, certainly not in a substantive way. I mean, I would still favor tonight if, if my f colleagues wanted to go that route to have a conversation to keep that going, I would still favor that. But it's, uh, I, I'm learning tonight, it's sounding like we're not going to get that passed. But I've come to a conclusion anyway that I think there's a better way, and I kind of hinted at it before with, the, with this list. In my hours, and, and, and truly hours, of, of conversations with people on all sides and reading, I, I, think, there, I think there is a, this doable list. I think if it was enacted by state legislatures, not city councils, state legislatures across this country, that truly communities could be made safer. And I don't have every idea formulated yet, but the list might include, so don't get all panicky, I'm just, these are ideas I got from all my conversations with gun owners and NRA uh, supporters and uh, people that are uh, gun, more gun control side. May, and if I'm wrong in some of this, I heard wrong, that's fine, but I'm just throwing ideas out. But it, it sounds like right now handguns have a permitting process that's more strenuous than long arms. It, maybe make all guns have an equal, some kind of permitting process. Right now there's all kinds of loopholes. Um, I could be sold a gun by my neighbor tonight going home and, and there's just nothing background check. We could, make, we could make that process fit into a background check process where if the seller didn't abide by that and that gun was used in a crime or something, there'd be heavy liabilities. Um, the red flag laws that our congressman has mentioned over the last week, uh, supported in five states, uh, but not Minnesota right now. And I saw um, our Senator um, Steve Swazinski here earlier, so I don't know if he, is he still here? Yeah. Steve, wave. Hi, Steve. Hi, Senator. So I'm, 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 
I don't know if we're going to do anything to make pass a resolution to recommend things to you, but I'm this is passing off to you because it's got to happen at a state legislative level. I mean, every everyone, a couple of speakers tonight that were very much pro um, gun ownership talked about bump stocks. That it's an obvious one. Then it's not ha it's not happening. We're not we're not moving on that because we can't get to this common middle ground. Um, Okay, there's just there, there's a whole bunch, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but it just gives the concept that there is a list that that we Americans can come together on and agree, 95% of us agree on, that I believe substantively will make us safer if every legislature across this nation passed it, and and maybe maybe even probably shouldn't be the only one sticking out there, or maybe we should, maybe we should be the ones that are raising this conversation to get hundreds of other communities across the state of Minnesota to join us to to write the list. That the list is, I, I bet I bet if 100 communities came up with it, nine out of 10 things on the list would be the same because they're all common sense. We're all mentioning these ideas, a list that would lower the probability of our community experiencing gun violence. City governments are the very closest representation to the people. You know, why is this not happening at the federal and state levels? Because of campaign money, it's just not. But if we can push it up at the grassroots level, we can get our legislatures to act and they can send on to the federal government and we can get substantive change. So I am suggesting that, and, and again, I've never asked this of you before, so I don't know if I'll get any support, but. I think it would be valuable for this council to send a list of ideas to, to our representatives, Jennifer Loon, Lori Pryor, to our senator, Steve Swazinski, to anyone else in the state capitol, just get it up there. And if we could get other cities to join on and they send their list and, and, and the legislature begins to recognize there's this groundswell of common sense, common ground, uh, American idealism that we can do something. So however we develop that list, we could do it at a workshop. We could just sit down. There, there's things, Brad, you and I, I disagree on some things. We agree on a lot, right? And, and we'd, we'd agree on 95% of that list. And one of, the, one of the ideas coming out of the pro NRA gun supporting side is just enforce present laws. Yeah, just enforce the present laws. That, that's on the list, right? I mean, th there's lots of things that could be on that list. So. I don't know how we develop it. I, I would just like our Eden Prairie community through their representatives to take a stand on common sense solutions that we need passed by our Minnesota legislature that will help make us safer. Again, as much as I do support our gun stores voluntarily joining in this conversation, maybe this isn't the exact way to do it, that's fine. I would love to see them join in this conversation though. Uh, I want to do something that's more substantive. I want to have a greater chance of making a difference. I hope that you will all join me. I hope all of you will join me. I hope every community in this state will join us in trying to make a difference and sending to the legislature formal re requests for substantive change. Let's come together. We can figure out a sensible way to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brad, did you want to speak? I did. My okay. button doesn't work right now. So. Oh, it doesn't? <laughs> no. Okay, sorry. All right. Well, um, I'm, I'm the father of three grown adult children, and now I have two beautiful uh, grand babies, so two baby daughters. And so uh, we're really excited about that. And I have pictures if anyone wants to see, like any good grandfather. Uh, but like all responsible adults, I'm very concerned about the safety of my family, and of course, I take my responsibility as a husband, father, and grandfather to protect them from harm very seriously. Uh, as any responsible citizen and council member, I am also very concerned for the safety and welfare of all children while at school or at home or at play, and the safety of all of our residents who live here, those who commute to Eden Prairie to work, and those who visit our wonderful community. I'm also very saddened and upset by the horrific acts of violence that we have seen in cities all over the world that are fueled by intentional acts of terror, revenge, or hatred. Murder is defined as the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. And these outrageous acts of murder anger me as I know they do you, whether they are committed with a handgun, a shotgun, an AR-15 rifle, a knife, pressure cooker, or other bomb, poison, car, trucks as we've seen recently, or an airliner. Evil deranged, 
or hate-filled individuals who desire to cause destruction and terror by killing others will always find a way to do so. If laws alone could stop these acts, then the world would already be safe because in every city, in every country in the world, there are laws in place to prohibit the murder of others. So we know that those who have perpetrated murderous acts do not abide by or care about our laws, nor do they care about common humanity or basic human rights and decency. Fortunately, the vast majority of us are responsible people and run responsible businesses, especially here in Eden Prairie, and we do care about abiding by our laws. I have spoken with our police department about preventative measures and proactive plans and our very competent police, firefighters, and Hennepin County Sheriff use to protect and ensure the safety of all. Our police department works very closely with the FBI and takes any possible credible threat very seriously and acts upon it. They also work very closely with the Hennepin County Sheriff, State Patrol, and other enforcement agencies, and they collaborate with our school district to make sure that we are doing everything reasonably possible to keep our children safe in school and out. And I am very proud of our community's dedication to its proactive attention to these, this specific issue. <clears throat> and we know that what we do works. And we know that we have state and federal laws that we enforce and regulate not only the sale of firearms, but also who is allowed to purchase them and who is allowed to possess them. And regulations regarding their manufacture, trade, transfer, record keeping, transport, and destruction of firearms, ammunition, and firearm accessories. In addition, in 1989, Eden Prairie passed its own ordinance that prohibits the discharge of any firearm or dangerous weapon in our city without a permit. A year later, in 1990, Congress passed the Guns Free School Zones Act, which prevents any unauthorized person from carrying a dangerous weapon onto any public, private, or parochial elementary and high school and non-private property within 1,000 feet of them. Our government has designed specific laws to prevent certain persons from possessing firearms. There's a Minnesota statute and it describes certain persons not allowed to possess firearms. Federal law also regulates who may not purchase or possess firearms and also regulates age restrictions. We have laws that regulate safety, require classes for carry permits, and require background checks for purchase. We are better prepared and better trained to keep firearms out of the hands of anyone who is not specifically eligible to own or even possess one through the proper application of our federal state laws on eligibility. We also have protective measures in place in our city and schools. We recognize the warning signs of potential perpetrators and act immediately to intervene and to prevent tragedy. We take immediate serious action regarding any threat or event, and we maintain a zero tolerance for any act of violence in our community. There is no gray area here. The safety of all people in our city is our first responsibility as city government, and our staff work together to do a stellar job in making sure that all the laws and ordinances related to firearms are upheld and strictly followed. Everyone involved in this matter takes their responsibility seriously and we do it the right way. I am confident that Eden Prairie is committed to and has been an excellent leader in both the prevention and action necessary toward anyone who would want to do us harm. Our police department coordinates with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office to ensure that only law-abiding citizens who are eligible to purchase firearms are able to do so in our city. They also work with the gun retailers in our city to ensure that they have the knowledge, skills, resources to ensure the utmost safety and that all regulations are followed. The process we have in place works well. We are a leader. It is how things should be done and an example for other cities to follow. The resolution before the council today is being driven by good intentions and emotions that we all feel when we hear about the recent senseless tragedies in other areas, and perhaps seen as a politically opportunistic by some, rather than conscientiously reviewing our policy for any potential issues or loopholes. 
I personally have visited the retailers in Eden Prairie selling AR-15 style firearms and other firearm retailers in Eden Prairie and have spoken with representatives from the Future Shields store, Steve Shields, as Councilmember Case uh, discussed, and I've discussed with them their policies and procedures that they will follow when they sell firearms. All of them follow all of the current laws and in addition, they use their own judgment so they not only do they sell to law-abiding citizens that have filled all the requirements, but they will deny selling to anyone, as Councilmember Case said, who looks like they shouldn't be uh, purchasing a firearm. Therefore, asking them to comply with current laws sends the wrong message and is inappropriate in my opinion. There is no need to ask them to apply comply. First of all, we have already ensured that they already do. And second, if they don't, they will be shut down, period. Likewise, asking them to go above and beyond, as this uh, resolution does, is inappropriate, undefined, and could lead to troublesome results. That is not fair, and it is not right. If we want to focus our concern on saving the lives of Eden Prairie residents, we should work on the opioid ap uh, epidemic. It has killed 10 times more people than gun homicides in our city in the last five years alone. An analogous resolution to this gun resolution would be to ask all of the pharmacies in Eden Prairie to voluntarily not sell OxyContin or other painkillers because we have heard that they lead to addiction and heroin use, or to ask them to age the, raise the age to purchase the prescription drugs to 20 years, 21 years of age. Another resolution we could consider is to ban high capacity liquor bottles and that our city owned liquor stores sell or to limit the amount of alcohol that we sell to any individual because they may drink to excess and harm themselves or others. There are many more alcohol related deaths and problems in Eden Prairie than firearm related ones. As a city council, we have all sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota and we need to stay focused on doing what the voters elected us to do, run the city efficiently, effect effectively by providing the services and amenities that they expect. I would encourage anyone who is truly concerned about gun safety to take a gun safety course, learn more about this topic firsthand, and if you still feel that we need to change the myriad of current gun laws, work with our state legislators to effect change. As already stated, gun and ammunition sales is a state and federal issue as in, and is not within our authority to regulate. Passing this resolution sets a precedent for unnecessary and nuisance resolutions on issues that we have no authority <coughs> to regulate. It is a distraction from our core responsibility to provide police, fire, water, sewer, streets, parks, and other core city services. Having the city attorney and city staff spend time creating a resolution that the city has no authority over is a waste of time and taxpayers money. News of this resolution has created angst for our businesses and many law abiding gun owners and residents as there is much confusion over what the intent of it is. The vast majority of people who have contacted us think that we are considering, considering an ordinance to ban the sale of certain firearms and raise the age limit to 21 for purchasing firearms. Implementing this resolution could harm our retail businesses. There are too many vague terms in this resolution and we should not pass resolutions that are vague and ambiguous. The bottom line is that this resolution is political grandstanding with no political value. Whichever side of this issue you stand on, this resolution does nothing uh, to change that and I cannot support it. It certainly sounds like the will of the council would not be to vote on this resolution, to even have a motion on it. Um, so I will not be asking for a motion. Uh, there are a couple of things that I wanted to add. Um, and part of this came from different things that people have said tonight. Part of it is a response to some of the emails that I received on this issue. Um, it was really kind of interesting, some of the the comments that were made um, by people um, accusing us of 
trying to override the Constitution. Um, we're not trying to override the Constitution. We're trying to bring some common sense measures into effect to, to deal with the issue of gun violence. Um, the Constitution is there to be amended. The Bill of Rights is there to be amended. Um, half the people in this room would not be voting if it weren't for an amendment to the Constitution. So something that's in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights is not there forever. It can be altered. And I think there's a desire in the public to have some common sense alterations to some of the rules surrounding um, guns. Uh, comments that we are overstepping our role. I don't think we are. We are responsible for the budget of the city. We're responsible for the planning. We're responsible for the parks. We're responsible for public safety. And we are not an island. We are part of a greater community, and we need to represent our community to the region. We need to represent our community of the state legislature and to the federal government. And the issues that are of concern to our citizens, we need to be a vehicle to have those issues heard by our state legislators and our, our Congress people. Um, I think it's very much the role and responsibility of our council. We are, the grassroots is all of you. We are the next step up maybe in the grassroots in getting things changed. And things don't change from the top down. Everything changes from the bottom up. So we need to make our voices heard about what we, what we see as an important thing. Um, I think, given that I've been thinking about this a lot over the last month, and I wasn't comfortable with the um, resolution either because of the fact that it doesn't have any teeth, it, it causes a lot of consternation. As Kathy, as you said, um, the discriminatory aspect of it is, is troubling. Um, but I was thinking that because of the fact that we can't really pass any laws that have to do with uh, gun sales or um, regulations around <coughs> guns, that's something that we have to work with our legislators and our Congress people on. So I would propose that we do a letter, um, and I just kind of briefly drafted it, a letter that would go to our legislators saying basically, as council members in the city of Eden Prairie, we've heard a great deal of concern from our residents about the issue of gun violence. Um, there is a desire to do something to make our residents, families, children, and children feel safer. However, we have no control over gun laws, nor are we the source for mental health funding. We also have many residents who feel the need for a gun to preserve their safety or to pursue their sport. We would request that you do what you can to address the issue of gun violence while protecting the constitutional rights of responsible law-abiding gun owners. And then the council sign it. Um, my, my thought is, we don't, I mean, we've come up with this list, and I think that would be an interesting exercise, but I kind of feel like it would take a ton of staff time. It's reinventing the wheel. Um, we're not the only people nationally who have thought about this issue. And so I think there's information out there that our legislature, le, legislators can gather to pursue some sort of change on this issue, and they just need to know that we want them to do something. I'll sign on to your letter. Yeah. yeah. Well, would somebody make a motion to that effect? I make a motion um, to put forward a letter that will be signed by the council and will go to the legislators in uh, the state government as well as federal. Second. Um, and I would just like to say I wouldn't want it any more specific than this. We just so is that the is that the letter as you read it right there, or would would we have a chance to? I'd like to review it yes. before yeah. I would yes. agree maybe to bring it to the next meeting. Yeah, yeah. I, I we'll would have not. staff flesh it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, then maybe we don't need a motion or anything on it now, mm -hmm. but I'll work with city staff to get the correct wording. Um, There's a motion on the table, first and second already. <laughs> oh, did we, we already do, do that? Do better, and then we could just get it. Work out the details. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that okay. fine? Is that fine? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I just, you know, I'd like to see the letter before this I. This is yeah. just the idea of sending Fine, that, yeah, write the letter, that's, okay. that's fine. All right, great, thank you. Uh, the motion passes. Okay, good. Okay, um, if anybody wants to get up and leave and they don't want to hear about Hampton Inn, it's 
Beautiful new project. Fascinating. If you want to Good project. That. <laughs> Otherwise, you're free to leave. Thanks for uh, coming tonight, Thanks all of you. Coming. Yeah. Thank you for your emails. Uh, Hampton Inn, Mr. Getchell. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, it's our first public hearing. It's the Hampton Inn project, as you mentioned. Uh, you may recall in 2016, uh, this property, the uh, IHOP property near Technology Drive and Flying Cloud Drive, received a PUD rezoning and site approval for the construction of Hampton Inn. Uh, the project is coming back now, uh, once again, slight, in a slightly different format. But this project is for the construction of a six-story, 105 uh, guest room hotel. And um, we have the developer here to provide a presentation and an overview of the entire project and provide detail of the proposed Hampton Inn construction. Then we have a public hearing. And then the staff and the developer can answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Please state your name for the record. Chris Flagg, Chief Investment Officer for TPI Hospitality, um, as, as well as the applicant DNT Eden Prairie LLC. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Madam Mayor, Councilors, good evening. It's a tough one to follow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less controversial. <laughs> <clears throat> Hampton Inn. <laughs> it's exciting, though. I, it really is. This has been my life for a long time. Um, all right, here we, here we go. I don't, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, second time's a charm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've been here before. I wanted to kind of revisit what we saw before. This was the old 2016 design. The Achilles heel in this design really was the structured parking. Um, when we got, when we finally got approved and through Watershed and we got our, got our construction bids, they came in well above expectations. We had to go back and kind of rethink this thing in order to make it work on the tight site. Here's another view of that 2016 design from the street. <clears throat> and then in the middle of this, Hampton Inn comes out with a new prototype design. <laughs> and we got to thinking, well, we don't like that either, but there's things we can take from there. So here's our new design, uh, proposed redesign. Um, certainly a much more modern contemporary look um, for that very important intersection uh, uh, parcel to the town. And then here's that same look from the street there with the landscaping. And then just to give you the, the side by side, this is kind of 2016 versus proposed. Oh, Looks nice. Is it the same height? It is a little bit taller. It's, it's actually one story taller, but it, it's from a height perspective, it's a little less than that because it sits further back in the site, and so it doesn't appear to be one story taller than the old one, but it is, in fact, one story taller. Site plan-wise, and you'll see here, on, we have the old building footprint on the left-hand side. We have the new building footprint on the right-hand side. So the new building footprint got smaller by about 1,200 square feet and was taken further back from the street, which allowed us the room to get our parking now on surface grade. And so we've eliminated that basement parking garage um, and made this thing feasible from a cost perspective. There's a couple other things about the site that I just want to go through just to jog the memories of warmer discussions. There's a very significant sewer and utility easement that runs the border of the site that we had to stay outside. We cannot construct anything except for on-grade parking and landscaping across a utility easement. We have a reciprocal access easement shown in this blue corner with ex our, our neighbor, Extended Stay America. We do also have a shared driveway to the south of that a reciprocal access, access easement that we are maintaining um, so that they can continue using their parking lot as they have done for the last 20 years. We had to work with light rail, uh, both from a, from a where is the line, where is the, the, the rail, permanent rail going to go, um, as well as the temporary construction needed. Uh, and so here you'll see that there's an orange shading around the border of the site that represents a temporary construction easement that uh, the light rail, uh, Southwest Light Rail has requested from us to construct the rail. On the far right hand side, you see this kind of black line with a, with a tan, that's my artistic uh, ability there. Um, 
showing the general location of what the rail, where the rail would, would cross um, the, the, uh, our, our site. And then on the dotted arrow, the yellow dotted arrow, um, we have uh, agreed pending approval of the, of the plan uh, that si Southwest Light Rail would have a reciprocal access e agreement uh, through our parking lot in order to service their proposed stormwater pond just south of our site. And they would access that pond from that so southern uh, property line uh, through a coordinated effort so we make sure that there's no cars parked there, et cetera, et cetera. Parking islands, this was, a, this was another big change since 2016. Um, here you can see the, uh, uh, the, the new parking island standards uh, coming into play here. So this has significantly more parking islands than the prior, uh, than the prior design did because of um, the, the council's uh, 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 decision to, to make that a, a real priority. And we appreciate the... We appreciate Just one question for you on the previous slide with the showing the light rail uh, path there. Um, do you know if that, when it's crossing the road there, is, are they going to have a, a sound alert or, you know, a bell or a, any, kind of, any kind of noise making as they're going across that? And are you concerned about that from a perspective of, uh, you know, annoying your, your, your guests? I, I, I don't want to speak for them. I don't know for sure, but we have designed the building assuming that is the case. Okay. And so our windows will be extra thick and we, we are... We're designing the building to, to for, with, with that To mitigate the, the potential noise. Absolutely. From, okay, Absolutely. That, that's good. That's what I wanted to hear. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Parking islands, again, significantly more parking islands than our prior design. Oops, excuse me. Pedestrian circulation, another important new initiative. Um, on the design standard side. And so we have, um, we've linked from a pedestrian uh, walkway standpoint, we've linked the existing trail uh, along Technology Drive to the front door of the building. We are also uh, going to be replaced, it's gonna be a new retaining wall, but it's gonna be in the exact same position as the old retaining wall um, along the Lakeside Trail. Uh, and we will, uh, uh, the, so the, we have the green trail that will, that will remain and we will improve. Um, along the lake, and then we have a nice new staircase that will be that will replace the existing staircase between the trail and the hotel, and everything will be Great. really nicely put together so you can go from the trail to the street without any real issues of walking on grass or a parking lot. Excellent. Sustainability features, LED lighting throughout the hotel. Mm -hmm. In fact, LED lighting is a is a is a standard across our entire portfolio. We're very proud of that fact. Okay. Um, bike racks, we do have one bike rack. I'll show you location here in the next slide. Native species, certainly pollinators, are going to be used um, in the wetlands area and the, uh, the wetland buffer area. Transportation reduction, again, bike rack. Uh, we are going to be close to mass transit, as we all know. Very happy to hear about the grant uh, for that, for, for that uh, town center station. Um, provisions for electric car, we do have an electric car charging stations. Uh, I'll show you a location for that in the coming slide. Energy Star appliances, zone controls for public spaces, zone, zone lighting controls for public spaces, and then certainly a construction recycling program uh, through the course of construction. Bike rack, we're going to locate the bike, where our proposed location uh, certainly can change with, with opinions, but um, uh, proposed bike rack location is going to be there, um, closely associated with the pedestrian connection between the hotel and the, uh, the, the trail along um, uh, technology drive mm -hmm. and then up in the up in the corner there near our drive aisle uh, we're proposing the location for our three electric vehicle car charging stations <coughs> so with that thank you and I welcome any questions at the appropriate time okay questions um, I have a couple of questions um, you addressed several things I was interested in one uh, the trail around the lake um, the other thing that I want to ask about is I've had the pleasure of having traveled, done a lot of traveling lately to all different continents. Everywhere, and this has been for like 20 years, people are using in their hotels the key card that has to go into the lights in order to preserve electricity. I mean, it doesn't, it goes into the thing on the wall, so you cannot turn the lights on unless you have your key card in there. To, and it preserves a lot of electricity. I assume that it really does, otherwise hotels wouldn't continue to be built in Argentina or Europe or whatever with those 
pieces of equipment. Why do we not do that in the United States? It's, it, we are. Uh, it's being driven instead of from a government standards to, uh, stipulation, it's being driven from the brands up. So the, uh, from, a Hilton Hamp, from Hilton, which is Hampton Inn's uh, parent brand, um, they do have energy initiatives with, that integrate with the property management system. There are motion detectors in the room that, that know when a person is in the room, and if, it, if it, the detector goes off, then the air conditioner or heater knows to turn on and to condition the room. If it doesn't sense motion for a number of minutes, it will turn off. Um, it knows time of day, so it knows that it's not going to see motion in the oh, middle of the night. Okay. Um, it's very, <laughs> extremely smart systems. Um, and, and then there, our, our older hotels have a master switch. Um, and so we have a, there in, these are 20 year old hotels, but we do have master switches right at the front door that are labeled master switches. And that switch turns all the electricity mm -hmm. off for the room. Uh, and so the, you know, that was kind of the old school way of doing it. Now there's the new school uh, okay. with the motion detectors. Okay. So it's a, uh, it, is, it is something that is, is working its way through, through the industry. Um, we, with, with being a franchise brand, we do have to abide by Hilton's policies. And so right. we kind of have to follow Hilton when it comes to, to, to the being on the, the leading edge of technology, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're moving pretty quickly. Okay, good. That's good to know. Um, Councilmember Nelson. Have you considered doing solar panels on your roof? We, we haven't. Um, I, we, well, I shouldn't say that. We, we, we have for our other hotels. And we, our conclusion, and I will admit that the study that we did was, was a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And the industry is changing quickly. Yeah, it um, is. We, we did not find there to be a return on that investment. Um, and it was primarily due to the fact that there, there are just too many cloudy days in Minnesota, um, whereas the hotels in California, they do see a return on their investment. Now, again, that was years, a couple years ago. Solar panels have come down significantly in cost. Um, you know, so we did not for this project, though. Mm -hmm. I know that a, a lot of people are starting to do that because there is a good cost effectiveness, and it sort of guarantees you power even you know, when lines are down and things, <coughs> which for a hotel could be important. A absolutely. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone from the audience that wants to address the council on Hampton Inn? Seeing none, I would move to close the public hearing and adopt the resolution for planned unit development concept review on 1.7 acres and approve the first reading of the ordinance for planned unit development district review with waivers on 1.7 acres and direct staff to prepare a development agreement incorporating staff and commission recommendations and council conditions. Second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you. It's a, it's a much better project for waiting, I think. Yeah. Welcome so back. Really good. <laughs> yeah. Are you pet friendly? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. The next item for public hearing is approval of the first reading of an ordinance amending city code Section 9.60 relating to the use of lake waters. Mr. Getcho. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. You may recall from previous discussions over the past uh, few years, we've been talking about amendments needed to Chapter 9. Uh, specifically, you might recall a lot of discussion of slow, no wake issues on, uh, you know, Bryant and Starring Lake, among other lakes. So uh, we've obviously spent a bit of time going through um, the entire chapter. We've gotten uh, DNR approval, and we're coming back with a first reading of an ordinance that, as I said, um, is being amended to um, add slow and awake restrictions, um, also allowing for small electric uh, motors. That's Duck Lake that relates to, and then some general updates throughout the section that bring the ordinance into compliance with state code. Um, I know uh, Mr. Ellis might have a couple additional comments, and the city attorney obviously played a role in the drafting of the ordinance as well. And then we would have a pub, uh, hold the public hearing um, following Mr. Ellis's comments. Okay. Your Honor, City Council, yeah, just, just a couple of things to add. This really goes back to 2014 when statewide there were issues with lakes, high water levels, causing erosion on the banks, floating docks. And if you remember at the time, the commissioner of the DNR uh, issued an executive order and said cities can this one time create no wake zones, but it's only for this year. And if you want to do it in the future, you need to create an ordinance that would give you that authority. And then, of course, they have to review the ordinance before council adopts it. So here we are four years later. Uh, it's kind of how long it's taken to get here. Um, this ordinance, 
uh, for the no wake provision will be for Starring Lake and Bryant Lake. We wanted to do Lake Riley as well. That lake is shared by two cities, Chan Hazen and Eden Prairie. We have to have identical ordinances. Chan Hazen just isn't in a position to move forward with that. So we finally have given up on that and just decided we need to move forward with the other two lakes. So this will allow the city to enact no wake zones when water levels get to that threshold where we know we start to have problems. Um, the other thing this does, uh, City Manager uh, Rick Getcho mentioned this, Duck Lake. Uh, we've had a number of neighborhood meetings uh, primarily because of the Duck Lake Road reconstruction project. Uh, but in meeting with uh, residents in, around the lake, they asked if a provision could be added to allow small electric motors up to three miles per hour on the lake. Right now, you can't use electric motors. And this was primarily being driven by residents that have mobility issues but would like to recreate on the lake but can't use self-propelled watercraft. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had a neighborhood meeting. Uh, there seemed to be overwhelming support from residents and HOAs that live around the lake. So uh, it seems like it was something we would support, something they support. So we're adding this. That would be a new provision. And, of course, DNR has approved that as well. Um, the other thing that's uh, changing with this ordinance, historically, uh, at least since 1996, the city council has issued permits for docks, for the installation of docks. And we had provisions about how long they could be and how big they could be and where they could be located. Well, we're really in conflict with DNR because they are the, the agency that does permits for docks. Statutorily, they're granted that authority. Uh, so frankly, our ordinances were in somewhat conflict with theirs. I don't know that I've ever issued a permit in the seven years that I've been here, so it's not something that routinely residents come to us. And besides, the DNR is charged with uh, doing the permits. They have a general permit that if you meet their standards, uh, you're covered under the general permit. So that city dock permitting is being removed. We are maintaining the provision that you're only allowed one dock per lot. So that was in at least since 1996, maybe even before that, we're maintaining that one dock per lot provision. Uh, and then the rest of it's really just housekeeping definitions uh, with the state have changed over time. Some of the provisions of our ordinance needed to be updated with what state statute allows now. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's really a, almost a re rewrite of the entire ordinance, but largely that's driven by the fact that we were out of compliance with state statute, and this would bring us back into compliance, and DNR, as Rick has mentioned, did sign off on this, and um, between Hennepin County and the conservation officers from DNR, they will likely do most of the enforcement on the lake. So that's a general summary of the amended ordinance. Yes. Uh, quick question. So, when when water levels reach a certain height, uh, uh, you know, in a flood condition, uh, does does the no wake uh, restriction go on automatically, or is it up to the city to enact or uh, issue a no wake uh, situation? This goes automatically. We have lake level specified for both Bryant and Starring. So when it hits that level, it's automatically no wake. Yep. Perfect. That, that's ideal. That's what we want. And I believe there are posting requirements that we have to do at the launches, the public launches, to notify people of the no wake. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ellis, regarding the one dock per lot stipulation, is that to prevent people from saying to their neighbor across the street, you can put a dock on my property, or is it to reduce the size? Because it seems like I've seen an awful lot of docks that go out and branch and go around and are pretty enormous docks. Yes, so you can have one dock, and I believe they allow up to six slips on a single okay. dock, but you can't have multiple docks. Um, I would guess the reasoning here is um, they're trying to protect um, the flow of water, uh, the species that, that live, both aquatic, uh, our mm -hmm. flora and fauna, that are uh, fish that live, and the more obstructions and Activity. that you put, yeah, yeah, and the shading, the, I think there's environmental consequences for that. So their viewpoint is if there's one lot, there's only one need for a single dock, there wouldn't be a need for multiple docks, then you start becoming a marina and they have a completely different set of provisions for marinas okay. and commercial. All right. Any other questions of Mr. Ellis? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone from the audience that wants to address the council on this issue? Okay, if you'd come up to the microphone and give your name and address for the record. Hello, Mayor and council members. My name is David Ziegler. I want to live at 16729 Baywood Terrace. 
and I am a member of the Homeowners Association for uh, Duck Lake. And we had a meeting on Saturday, and we are uh, supportive of this change. Um, we feel very strongly a lot of our uh, homeowners are uh, uh, getting older. I guess we're all getting older. <laughs> but um, anyway, there's been uh, heart attacks, heart surgeries, uh, multiple hip replacements, shoulder <laughs> replacements, and uh, we're not quite as agile and easy or capable of paddling around as we used to be. Um, so small electric motors would be a great benefit to those who live on and near the lake. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ziegler. Um, I think you were next. Uh, Mayor uh, Tyra Lukens, my name is Dan Gustafson. I live at 1040 East Circle Drive in Wyzetta, Minnesota. I'm here tonight to speak to you about um, your surface water regulations and the, specifically the one dock per lot uh, provision that is contained within the uh, proposed ordinance. I've worked with uh, city staff a little bit and met with them offline and offered some feedback to them, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of that with you here tonight, but I, I want to just, uh, and I, I'll try and be very quick, just step through um, some of the statutes that need to guide your decision as you um, enact <coughs> surface water regulation, if you would allow me. Why don't you hand them to me and I'll send them down, and then you can get started. Oh. So I met uh, Leslie Stovering in the, in the uh, hall earlier uh, tonight, and she was very gracious and kind to me. And I, I told uh, Leslie that I played Texas Hold'em with my uh, brother-in-laws on Saturday night, and it was the first time I'd ever played. I bought in for $20, and I drew pocket aces. And I don't know if you know what that means, but it's the best hand that's available to you in, in poker. Um, I, I put... Um, Minnesota Statute 459.20, Authority Over Public Waters, as the top sheet in this uh, presentation to, to show you your pocket aces, to show you the best uh, statutes that you have available to yourselves in order to regulate surface waters. Okay, I'll move on to 103A001, which is the next page. The effect of Chapter 103 on water law, and it, it, this statute describes the chapters that are water law. 103A201 is the regulatory policy for the state of Minnesota. I would point you to subdivision one, ellipse one, subject to existing rights, public waters are subject to the control of the state. <laughs> I'm moving on to 103F205. Definition for shoreland, the definition for shoreland is land within a thousand feet from the normal high water mark of a lake or pond. And so if you view that on your zoning map or in a plat map of Bryant Lake, the ordinary high water mark is the, is the boundary, the regulatory boundary between land and water. And this statute is saying that land is everything from the ordinary high water mark, and particularly shoreland, to a thousand feet away. Make sense? 103G005, I would point you to subdivision 14, which is the ordinary high water level. The ordinary high water level by statute and your zoning ordinance and city code, to my understanding, means the boundary of water basins, water courses, public waters, and public waters, wetlands. I'll jump very quickly. 86B001, water use policy. It is the policy of this state which is blessed with an abundance of water to promote its full use and enjoyment by all of the people now and in the future. 86B201, local authority, this is talking about the city's ability to enact re surface water regulations. Local authority to adopt an ordinance Excuse me. 
This chapter does not limit, I'm in subdivision two, this chapter does not limit the authority of a political subdivision of this state to adopt regulations that are not inconsistent with this chapter and the rules of the commissioner relating to the use of waters of this state. What that means in layman's terms is that you can't promulgate a rule that is in opposition to the statutes and the administrative rules uh, put forth by the commissioner. I'll jump very quickly to 86B205, subdivision <coughs> three. Prior ordinances are invalid uh, without approval. Approval, a surface use zoning ordinance adopted under subdivision two to five, and we'll look at subdivision five in just a moment, by a local government unit after May 25th, 1973 is invalid unless it is approved by the commissioner. This provision under subdivision five, and you'll recall the very first ordinance I pointed to and said pocket aces, this is your regulatory scheme, allows you to uh, take over county regulatory authority. I'm in subdivision five, paragraph three, regulate the construction, installation, and maintenance of permanent and temporary docks and moorings in a manner consistent with state and federal law, permits required, et cetera, et cetera. 86B211, the commissioner, and they're talking about the commissioner of natural resources, shall adopt rules that relate to placement and regulation of docks. What that, what I, how I interpret this is that there are rules for the rule makers. Make sense? The Minnesota Administrative Rule 6115.0150, purpose and statutory authority. The reason that I brought this one to your attention, uh, Council and your and Mayor, is this is part of the same chapter that is um, before you tonight in 9.60, uh, and I'm going to hold I'm going to hold both of these in my hand at the same time. This is 6115. 0.050 and 6115.0210. One's the statutory authority, one's the rules for structures and public waters. Again, 6115 being the common thread, they're in the same chapter. The purpose of part 6115.0150 to 6115.0280 is to provide for the orderly and consistent review of permit applications in order to conserve and utilize the water resources of the state in the best interest of its Madam people. Madam Mayor, can I have yes. a question? Um, what is your point with all of this? In you know, fact, could you cut to the chase? We all, I mean, this we is have, interesting, we but have you have a city attorney, <laughs> you don't live in Eden Prairie, so what is your yeah, purpose? Just tell us what your, what your issue is. If you would, please. Yeah, can I, can I finish this, this sentence? No. Would you just tell us? Just, <laughs> just, just, just tell us what the point is, and then we'll look through, and you the, can... The, the point is, is um, the purpose of statutory authority is that regulates structures in public waters, which is in your nine, proposed 9.60, is subject to existing rights, 103A201. So a, 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 a surface water ordinance that comes after uh, 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 a legal instrument which transfers riparian rights and the right to build a wharf by statute is, is not allowed to be outlawed. And on top of that, Mr. Case, um, th those rights, whether they're exercised or not, it, it's up to the proprietor to determine when those rights are exercised. So let me be clear. You're saying that our ordinance tonight that we're looking at with the docks is null and void. Sorry, I didn't say that. Well, that, I don't know what you're saying. I'm asking you to say what you're saying, please. <laughs> and also, do you own property in the Prairie or represent someone owning property? I'm here on behalf of the public. The public owns, the state owns the lake bed. The public has rights to navigate in the waters. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, I mean, it's late and, and, and we want to be helpful to you to help us. So, I mean, just if you would just tell us what you're trying to say, because I'm not a lawyer and we have a lawyer <laughs> and he would go through all the statutes, but if you could just tell us what you're interested in, I would be interested in that. I'm a, I'm a guardian of riparian rights, okay? And, and my experience is very similar to Dr. Salvich's experience, that he experienced 
in working with you, okay? In 2013, I bought a piece of property in Plymouth. Plymouth used, tried to use land use rules to affect water rights. And Eden Prairie has, has taken that course of action on the advice of its attorney over the last two or three years. And I'm here because you're talking about regulating the water, not the land, pointing out to you that you cannot, as an example in Plymouth, they put, forth, they put forth a rule that said a dock was an accessory structure on land and that you had to build a primary structure in order to wharf into the public lake bed. And that doesn't hold much water. So did it get contested and has it been declared illegal? City declared it illegal, sent me a zoning letter. I sent them a response and then they never, they never responded. In addition to that, the neighbors, after a period of time, when I pointed out that they are not able to use land use rules to, to regulate docks in the water, the neighbor then bought the, par bought the parcel from me in order to uh, solve the issue completely, if that makes sense. Would it be possible just to have maybe in our packet or something just a comment by staff and, and at least address this um, at, at another time? <laughs> just have some written comment I'm back. I'd love to hear from our attorney at some point. Or, or do it now, yeah. It's up to the mayor, but I just, yeah, we got to. Do you, do you want me to address this or do you want me to you. Uh, this to finish? Um, so I represented the property owner that uh, purchased the property from Mr. Gustafson. <coughs> so you need to know that. Um, ran into my private client the other night as I was leaving the office. And um, so um, <coughs> I think Mr. Gustafson <coughs> has uh, referred to the Salovich matter. Uh, you recall that that was brought to you the uh, Planning Commission upheld the uh, issue that the use of the second dock was abandoned. Uh, the council upheld that. Uh, the property owner was put the dock back in. I believe Mr. Gustafson started uh, advising the property owner, working with him with respect to this issue. He was at least a witness uh, for the property owner in the prosecution matter. Um, and um, contending that they had that right to have that second dock in there. So I think this is all about the second dock. We've looked at that issue. The prosecution matter was resolved on a matter satisfactory to the city. The property owner's attorney approached my prosecutor and uh, with a proposal to resolve it and it was acceptable and resolved uh, the dock was removed uh, I think Mr. Gustafson from what I understand would like to see that restriction removed from the ordinance or would like to see a variance process a waiver process I don't recommend either process uh, I've reviewed you know, my office and I, my associate, worked on the changes that you see in the ordinance, working with Ms. Stovering, Mr. Ellis, to bring this to you tonight. Um, I've also taken a lot of time to look at all the provisions relating to your authority and including the statutes that have been talked about tonight. You have the authority to regulate docks outside of the zoning authority. I'm not sure if it's in this uh, packet, but it's in the regular statutory chapter 412. You're allowed to regulate docks and wharfs. Uh, Mr. Gustafson has shared uh, court opinions with uh, Mr. Getcho and Mr. Ellis. Those court opinions support the authority of the city to regulate docks under chapter 412. So I believe you have all the authority you need in order to uh, 
adopt the ordinance in the manner in which it's uh, being presented. Thank you. I mean, at the end of the day, you are our um, decision maker supporter that you help us because you will defend us. So yes. we um, hire you to give us the best advice, and I'm comfortable with that this evening. So thank you. If Thank I could, you. I'd like to uh, just respond very, very quickly uh, to Mr. Rosso. Um, you, you ha you, I agree. You have the right to regulate docks. You do. You, you, could, you could pass an ordinance under what Mr. Rosso is proposing that all docks have to be yellow or 100 feet or 2 feet wide or any other provision that you want to promulgate. It doesn't mean that it's reasonable. And it doesn't mean that it, it um, will stand up to challenge. And good planning takes into account existing uses. You're instructed as part of this review of your surface water regulations to inform the DNR of private property rights. And it hasn't happened. And so I, I appreciate that you want to whisk me from the podium and not <laughs> deal with this anymore. Okay. Well, we well, have an attorney, though, that, that is giving us advice sir, that circumvents yours. L let me address that, okay? Well, <laughs> <It's a laughs> very, very, very quickly, <laughs> very quickly. I did testify at the, at the salvage hearing, okay? Prior to that, uh, the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney and the judge sat in chambers for an hour, and the judge came out and basically said she didn't want to touch it because the provision, the, the, the legal arguments for and against were, were, were great and compelling on both sides, and she felt like whatever ruling she might make would be challenged. And so I'm coming to you to say to you there are, there are approximately 50 proprietors on Bryant Lake, and a 51st is not an unreasonable use. I'm not advocating to you that you should allow two docks on every property in Eden Prairie, okay? That's your business. I, I get that, you wanna have that regulation in place. But you have, a, you have a private property owner that has a legal right to do it the way the ordinance is written today and the way it's proposed doesn't specify. You have two, you have two proprietors that have the same right the way the code is written to wharf into the lake and you've only held one accountable. And so how do you hold one accountable? It's, it's, it's not good planning. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to help, be helpful to you in your decision-making okay, process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gitcho, do we have uh, any idea what other cities do if they have similar rulings and have taken action like this? Did I say Mr. Gitcho? I meant Mr. Rosso, sorry. Oh, oh you're hey. <laughs> Lucked out. Yeah. I was gonna give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, him and say right. yes. okay, why not? Uh, I haven't looked to see uh, if other communities have the two dock issue. Other communities have uh, regulated in a variety of ways um, that have um, to try and reach a, a similar uh, result. But I could look at that if between now and second reading, if you wanted uh, information about that. I, I would say, in, in with respect to Mr. Gustafson's uh, uh, presentation about the, the rights of the owners, that they are not similar between the owner of the off lakeshore property who has an easement to the lake. Right. That owner, the case law is very clear, does not have riparian rights. The owner of the lakeshore property has the riparian rights. Riparian rights under the case law cannot be abandoned. If you don't have riparian rights, they are subject to abandonment. Your, your rights to, to maintain that second dock, and that was the basis for on which the city proceeded. So we have a fundamental uh, difference about that, um, and, and I am quite confident that, that my reading of the case law is, uh, is accurate, so. Great. Thank you, is there anyone else to address the council on this? Okay. Uh, I would move to close the public hearing. Let me make sure I'm on the right one B, correct? Yep. And approve the first reading of an ordinance amending city code section 9.60. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Next just item. One, can I make just one comment on that? Is, is there any way that we could offer um, a process where someone could request a variance, or you're saying that we should not venture into that and open that up? Um, there's, there's not a way that you could do that and not affect every lot on the lake. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you heard Mr. Gustafson say he wasn't interested in all those other parcels, but only really this parcel. There's a purchaser of this parcel who understands the action that's been taken by the city. Um, so you could not include in your ordinance a process for variance or waiver without it being applicable to not only this lake, but every lake. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next item is a vacation of a drainage and utility easements line over, under, and across lots one and two, block one, ERS estates. Mr. Getchell. Uh, yes, Mayor, as you stated, pretty straightforward. You have an easement running between lot one and two, which I believe has common ownership, and the request is to um, vacate the easement across lot one and two, and um, city staff supports that. Okay. Any questions for staff? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone from the audience that wants to address the council on the vacation of this easement? Hearing none. Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing and adopt the resolution vacating parts of the drainage and utility easements lying over, under, and across lot one and lot two, block one, ERS estates, according to the recorded plats thereof, Hennepin County, Minnesota. Second, love those prepositions. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Lastly, we have payment of claims. Is there a motion for approval? Move approval. Second. Any items to question? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Aho. Aye. Councilmember Butcher Wickstrom. Aye. Councilmember Case. Aye. Councilmember Nelson. Aye. Mayor Tara Lukens. Aye. Uh, any other business to bring before the council? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.